Representation Theory of Finite Groups, Lecture 15 Standard Young Tableaus Let us start with our setup. We fix a positive integer n and we let lambda be a partition of n. So we view lambda as the corresponding Young diagram. Yt of lambda denotes the set of all Young tableaus of shape lambda and Ytd of lambda denotes the set of all Young tabloids of shape lambda. A Young tabloid is a row equivalence class of Young tableaus. The group Sn acts on both Yt lambda and Ytd lambda. The linearization of the action of Sn on Ytd lambda is called the permutation module for lambda and denoted M upper lambda. For a Young tableau T, of shape lambda, we denote by ct the column stabilizer of T and by ct minus the corresponding anti symmetrizer. Then, for each young tableau T, we can define the polytabloid ET as the image of the tabloid of T under the action of the anti symmetrizer ct minus. By definition, ET is an element of the permutation module. Also, on the set of all partitions, we have the so-called dominance order, which we denote by this kind of triangle, which is rotated 90 degrees. Last time, we defined and studied the so-called Specht modules. So we denote by S upper lambda the linear span of all polytabloids ET inside the permutation module M upper lambda. So the space S lambda is called the Specht module associated with the partition lambda. So we saw the following examples that the module Sn, so the Specht module associated to the partition N, is the trivial Sn module. The Specht module associated to the partition 1 to the power n, so this is a partition 1, 1, 1, and so on. So this Specht module is isomorphic to the sine Sn module and the Specht module associated to the partition n minus 1 comma 1 is isomorphic to the complement to the trivial Sn module inside the natural Sn module. So we have already seen the following properties of Specht modules. First of all, S lambda is an Sn submodule of the permutation module. Then S lambda is a simple Sn module. S lambda is isomorphic to S mu if and only if lambda is equal to mu. And every simple Sn module is isomorphic to S lambda for some partition lambda of n. So in particular, the set of all Specht modules is a complete and irredundant set of representatives of the isomorphism classes of simple Sn modules. We also know that in the case S lambda is a summand of some permutation module M mu, then lambda dominates mu. And the multiplicity of S lambda in M lambda is 1. So the aim for today is to find a basis of the Specht module S lambda. We have defined S lambda as a linear span of some elements inside the permutation module. These elements are usually not linearly independent. So the aim for today is to find a set of linearly independent elements among these generators of the Specht module. In order to be able to formulate the main result, we need to introduce the notion of a standard Young tableau. A Young tableau T of shape lambda is called standard, provided that all rows of T increase left to right and all columns of T increase top to bottom. So here is an example. Consider all Young tableaus of shape 2, 1. So there are six such Young tableaus. So these Young tableaus are so 1, 2 in the first row and 3 in the second row, 1, 3 in the first row and 2 in the second row, 
to one in the first row and three in the second row, to three in the first row and one in the second row, three two in the first row, one in the second row, three one in the first row and two in the second row. Out of these six tableaus, only two tableaus are standard. So here are given in the orange color. So it's one, two and three and one, three and two. So for these two tableaus, both rows and columns increase. So if you take the next tableau, two, one, three, then two is greater than one. So this tableau is not standard. Similarly, two, three, one, two, is greater than one, this tableau is not standard, and so on. Here are some further examples of standard Young tableaus of shape 4431. So here is a tableau 1349, 26811, 510, 12, and 7. So here we see that all rows and all columns increase. So the next tableau is probably the easiest way to write a standard Young tableau. We just fill in the Young diagram with the numbers from 1 to n, left to right and top to bottom. So we just proceed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Of course, what we get will be a standard Young tableau. A slight variation of this, we can fill in our numbers top to bottom and then left to right. So column-wise, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Notation SYT sub lambda denotes the set of all standard Young tableaus of shape lambda. Now we are ready to formulate our main theorem. For any partition lambda of n, the set of all polytabloids indexed by standard Young tableaus forms a basis of the Specht module S lambda. An immediate corollary is that for any partition lambda of n, the dimension of the Specht module as lambda equals the cardinality of the set of standard Young tableaus of shape lambda. Another corollary is the following identity. n factorial is equal to the sum over all partitions lambda of n, the square of the cardinality of the set of standard Young tableaus of shape lambda. Proof? So this equality is easily obtained if we note that the two sides of this equality compute the dimensions of the following isomorphism. So if we take the left regular representation of Sn, we know by our general theory of representations of finite groups that the left regular module decomposes into a direct sum of simples and each simple appears with a multiplicity which is equal to its dimension. So the left regular representation of Sn, whose dimension is n factorial, is isomorphic to the direct sum of S lambdas, and each lambda appears with a multiplicity its dimension. Taking into account the previous corollary, we get exactly our identity. Another corollary, now from the previous corollary from this identity, is that there is a bijection between the symmetric group and the disjoint union over all partitions lambda of n of the Cartesian product of the set of standard Young tableaus of shape lambda with itself. Proof? More or less by definition, the cardinalities of the two sides of these bijections are given by the two sides of the identity which we just established. And if two sets have the same cardinality, then of course there is a bijection from one of them to another. Let us now illustrate our main theorem by examples. Example 1. Consider the partition n of n. Then there is only one standard Young tableau for this partition, namely the tableau where we write elements from 1 to n in the usual order in one row. We know that the Specht module corresponding to this partition is isomorphic to the trivial Sn module, and it has dimension 1. So in particular, the polytabloid associated to our unique standard Young tableau, it is a non-zero element of both M upper N and S upper N. Then, since it's a non-zero element and the Specht module is one-dimensional, 
this polytabloid forms a basis of the Specht module. Similarly, if we consider the partition 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on of n, then there is only one standard Young tableau for this partition, namely we write elements from 1 to n in the natural order in one column. Again, we know that the corresponding Specht module is one-dimensional, it's the sign module, and therefore the polytabloid associated to this standard Young tableau, it's a non-zero element of a one-dimensional module, so it forms a basis of this module. So here is a slightly more complicated example. Consider the partition n minus 1, comma 1 of n. Then there are exactly n minus 1 standard Young tableaus for this partition. Namely, we can take any of the elements 2, 3, and so on up to n and place them in the second row, in the unique box of the second row. And in the first row, we write the remaining elements in the natural order. So let us denote by T upper i the standard Young tableau where i is placed in the second row. So i is an element between 2 and n. The permutation module m, upper n minus 1, comma 1, is isomorphic to the natural Sn module, and it has the usual basis given by the tabloids denoted by this script j, where j is an element between 1 and n, and this number j is placed in the second row of the tabloid. We know that the dimension of the Specht module for n minus 1, comma 1 is equal to the dimension of the natural module minus the dimension of the trivial module. So the Specht module is the complement of the trivial in the natural module. So this dimension is n minus 1. n is a dimension of the natural module, and 1 is a dimension of the trivial module. And then the polytabloids E, T, J, which are associated to our standard Young tableaus T, Js. So in the standard basis of the natural module, they are exactly the elements J minus 1. So J is this tabloid, and 1 is this tabloid where we have 1 in the second row. So these polytabloids are obviously linearly independent, and... Therefore, they form a basis of the Specht module as n minus 1, comma 1, because there are exactly as many as the dimension of this module. Now we need to prove the main theorem. To prove that something is a basis of something, we need to prove two things. First of all, we need to prove that the elements are linearly independent. And second, we need to prove that they generate the whole space. So here we also we start with the proof that the set of polytabloids associated to standard Young tableaus is linearly independent. In order to do this, we have to talk about compositions. A composition of n is a vector, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, where all lambda i's are non-negative integers, and the sum of all these lambda i's is equal to n. So this is a notation that lambda is a composition of n. And of course, directly by the definition, each partition is a composition. So the main difference between partitions and compositions is that, that in a partition, the parts are supposed to weakly decrease, while in the composition, we don't have any such requirement. And in particular, because of that, for any n, there are infinitely many compositions of n. So, for example, here are some compositions of 3. So, the partition 3, then the composition 0, 3, the composition 0, 0, 3, the partition to 1, or the composition 1 and 2, then 1, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, and so on. So the notions of Young diagram, tableaus, tabloids, and the dominance order, they extend to the set of all compositions in the obvious way. So now let us talk about compositions which are associated with tabloids. Let T be a Young tabloid of shape lambda. For I between 1 and N, define T upper I 
as a tabloid formed by all entries which are less than or equal to i in t. And also define lambda upper i, this will be a composition of i, as the shape of the tabloid t upper i. So here is an example. For the tabloid t of shape 2, 2, which has the elements 2 and 3 in the first row and 1 and 4 in the second row, we have the following. So the tabloid t upper 1 has nothing in the first row and 1 in the second row. The tabloid t upper 2 has 2 in the first row and 1 in the second row. The tabloid t upper 3 has 2 and 3 in the first row and 1 in the second row. And the tabloid t upper 4 has 2 and 3 in the first row and 1 and 4 in the second row. Therefore, the corresponding compositions lambda 1 is equal to 0 and 1. So t1 has nothing in the first row, so we have the 0, and it has one element in the second row, so we have here 1. So lambda 2 is the composition 1, 1, because t2 has one element in the first row and one element in the second row. Lambda 3 is a composition 2, 1, because t3 has two elements in the first row and one element in the second row. And lambda 4 is the composition 2, 2, because T4 has two elements in the first row and two elements in the second row. Now we can define the dominance order for tabloids. For two tabloids T and S, with the corresponding composition sequences lambda upper i and mu upper i, we will say that T dominates S, provided that lambda upper i dominates mu upper i for all i. And we will use the same notation for the dominance order on tabloids as we use for the dominance order on partitions. So here is an example. Consider the tabloid of shape 2, 2, which has 1 and 2 in the first row and 3 and 4 in the second row, and the tabloid S of the same shape, which has 1 and 3 in the first row and 2 and 4 in the second row. Then we see that the composition series for t is 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. So this is because for 1 it's in the first row, 1 and 2 are in the first row, 1, 2, 3 are two elements in the first row, 1 in the second row, and 1, 2, 3, 4 is the whole thing. While for the tabloid S, the corresponding composition sequence is 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 2, 2. So this is because, so 1 is in the first row, but then 1 and 2 are in the first and in the second row, so we have 1, 1 here. Then we have 1, 2, and 3, two elements in the first row, 1 in the second row, 2, 1, and the last one is the whole thing. So note here that lambda 1 is equal to mu 1, lambda 3 is equal to mu 3, and lambda 4 is equal to mu 4, while lambda 2 dominates mu 2, because 2 dominates 1, 1. Therefore, the tabloid T dominates the tabloid S. Here is a more general example. So here is the Hasse diagram for the dominance order on the set of all 2,2 2 tabloids. So the tabloid 1, 2 and 3, 4 is the maximum element. Then we have 1, 3 and 2, 4. So we have just seen that 1, 2, 3, 4 dominates 1, 3, 2, 4. Then on the next layer we have two elements, 2, 3, 1, 4 and 1, 4, 2, 3. So they are incomparable with each other, but both are smaller than 1, 3, 2, 4. Then there is an element 2, 4, 1, 3, which is smaller than the two previous ones, and the minimum element is 3, 4, 1, 2. Now, when we have defined the dominance order, we can talk about the dominance lemma for tabloids. Lemma. Assume that A and B are two different elements between 1 and N, such that A is smaller than B, and A appears in a lower row in the tabloid T than the element B. Then, when we swap A and B in T, we get a tabloid which dominates T. Proof. 
Let us denote by lambda upper i the composition sequence for the tabloid obtained from T by swapping A and B. And let mu i be the composition sequence for the original tabloid T. Then, directly from the definitions, we see that if i is smaller than a, or is greater than or equal to b, then lambda upper i is equal to mu upper i. At the same time, if i is between a and b, then the composition lambda upper i is obtained from the composition mu upper i by moving one box from the lower row in T, so this was the box which correspond to A, and we swap it with the box which corresponds to B, which was in the higher row, so we move one box from a lower row to a higher row of T. And if we do that, then of course the partition for lambda, which has a box higher up in the Young diagram, so this partition will dominate the partition mu. So for such i, lambda upper i dominates mu upper i. Therefore, by definition, if we apply the transposition of a, b to t, we get a tabloid which dominates t. Let us now look closer into the structure of polytabloids indexed by standard Young tableaus. Let t be a standard Young tableau of shape lambda, and let S be a Young tableau of shape lambda. Assume that the tabloid of S appears with a non-zero coefficient when one writes the polytabloid ET as a linear combination of the standard basis elements of the permutation module M lambda. Then the tabloid of T dominates the tabloid of S. Proof. From the definition of the polytabloid ET, we, of course, may assume that S is equal to sigma of T for some element sigma in the column stabilizer of T. So we defined ET as uh, CT minus applied to T, and CT minus is a linear combination of elements from CT. So we may assume that S is of such a form. Each column stabilizer CT is a product of the symmetric groups, so we can write our element sigma from CT as a product of transpositions in these symmetric groups in the shortest possible way. By induction on the lengths of this product, so sigma can be written as a product of transpositions in the shortest possible way, so we induct on the lengths of this product, so what we need to prove is that, that on the induction step, when we transpose two elements A and B, we get a new tabloid, which is strictly smaller than the original one in the dominance order. But what happens when we transpose two elements A and B? So we start from a standard tableau T, and in the standard tableau, all columns are ordered from top to bottom increasingly. So when we transpose two elements, so we move a larger element from a row which is below, to the row which is higher up. So we can use the dominance lemma for tabloids from the previous slide and conclude that if we do such a swap, the new tabloid which we obtain will be strictly smaller in the dominance order than the tabloid which we start from. And then by induction, we complete the proof of this lemma. Now we are ready to prove linear independence of polytabloids associated to standard Young tableaus. So we prove the proposition that the set of all polytabloids indexed by standard Young tableaus of shape lambda is linearly independent. Proof. Consider the matrix M, whose rows are indexed by standard Young tableaus and whose columns are indexed by Young tabloids of shape lambda. And the row, which corresponds to the standard Young tableau T, contains the coefficients which we obtain when we write the polytabloid ET as a linear combination of standard basis elements in the permutation module. Now let us order the rows of this matrix decreasingly with respect to some linear extension of the dominance order. 
And similarly for the columns, the previous lemma says that if we take a poly tabloid associated to the standard Young tableau, then everything which appears there with a non-zero coefficient is strictly smaller with respect to the dominance order. So by the previous lemma, we immediately get that this matrix M is in its row echelon form. In particular, since all rows of this matrix are non-zero, it follows that the rank of this matrix equals the number of rows, and therefore the rows of this matrix are linearly independent, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. Okay, so we have proved one half of the main result. Now we want to prove that the polytabloids associated to standard Young tableaus generate the Specht module as a vector space. So in more details, we want to prove that each polytabloid for any Young tableau of shape lambda belongs to the linear span of the polytabloids associated to standard Young tableaus. Let us start with the following observation. If we have a Young tableau T of shape lambda, and if sigma is an element in the column stabilizer of T, then the polytabloid associated to sigma T, so this is always equal to sigma times E of T, but then since sigma is in the column stabilizer of T, sigma times E of T is plus or minus E of T. We saw this. So in particular, E T belongs to our linear span if and only if E sigma T belongs to our linear span. So using the elements in the column stabilizer, we can always assume that the columns of all tableaus we consider increase top to bottom. So in what follows, we basically can only work with tableaus in which the columns increase top to bottom. Definition, a row descent in a tableau is a part of some row of the form A, B. So A is in the box to the left of B and A is greater than B. And the main challenge for us is how to eliminate a row descent. So we want to take a Young tableau in which columns are already ordered, but rows are not necessarily ordered, which means that in some row we have such a row descent. And what we are going to do next, we are going to describe a procedure how we can take such a row descent and write the corresponding polytabloid as a linear combination of some other polytabloids where we don't have this row descent anymore. Since our columns are already ordered, each row descent of this form actually gives us the following picture. So we have our big Young tableau team, and then in some row i, we have this row descent ai staying next to bi, so ai is on the left, but is bigger. If you consider all elements in the same column as bi, which are above bi, so these are ordered, these are elements b1, b2, and so on, up to bi. So this is a set of ordered elements. Then bi is smaller than ai, and then we consider also all elements in the column of ai, which are below ai, so ai plus 1, and so on, ak. Then we get a sequence of elements which are ordered in the natural order. Okay, so let us introduce the following notation. Let us denote by capital A the set of all elements in the same column as AI, which are below AI, and we denote by B the set of all elements which are in the same column as BI, which are above BI. And we consider the symmetric groups S on A union with B, and then the symmetric groups S on A and S on B. And of course, directly from the definition, S A times S B is a subgroup of S A union with B. An interesting observation that each coset of S A union with B modulo S A times S B acting on the right contains a unique element which we denote sigma xi. So if xi was our coset, then the corresponding element is sigma xi. So it contains a unique element such that if we look at these parts on the positions where we had these elements from A union with B, 
then the columns of sigma xi of t are ordered increasingly top to bottom. So basically it means that we permute arbitrarily the elements A and B in this picture, and then without changing the columns, we order the elements which end up here, and we order the elements which end up here. So the Garnier element associated to our descent is then defined as the element GAB, which is the sum over all cosets from S a union with B modulo as A times as B acting on the right. And then as a corresponding summand, we take the element sigma xi with its sign times the sign of sigma xi. So this is called the Garnier element associated to our row descent. So here is an example. Consider the following tableau of shape 3 to 1. So we have 1, 2, 3 in the first row, 5, 4 in the second row, and 6 in the third row. So we have here the row descent 5, 4 in the second row. So the set A is equal to 5, 6. The set B is equal to 2, 4. So we have the symmetric group on 2, 4, 5, 6. And we should take the cosets module of the symmetric group on 5 and 6 times the symmetric group on 2 and 4. So there are six such cosets because S4 has cardinality 24 and we should divide by 2 times 2 by 4. So we have six such cosets. And we have the tableaus which correspond to our element sigma xi. So we arbitrarily permute elements in positions 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 1. And then we order the columns without changing the columns. So the first element is just team. Then we just choose that in the second column we have 2 and 5 in the order. Then in the first column we end up with 4 and 6 in the order. Then we choose 2 and 6 in the second column, then 4 and 5 in the first column. 4 and 5 in the second column, 2 and 6 in the first column. 4 and 6 in the second column, 2 and 5 in the first column. 5 and 6 in the second column, 2 and 4 in the first column. And then we see that the corresponding elements sigma xi are, so for t is just the identity. This tableau is obtained from t by swapping 4 and 5, so it's just a transposition for 5. So here, what we do, we map 4 to 6, 5 to 4, and 6 to 5. So this is a 3 cycle 4, 6, 5. So here we have the 3 cycle 2, 4, 5. Here we have the 4 cycle 2, 4, 6, and 5. And here we swap 2 and 5 and 4 and 6. So the associated Garnier element is a linear combination of the identity with the sign plus because it's even. Then we have four and five as a sign minus because transpositions are odd. So three cycles are even, so it's plus the three cycle four, six, five, plus the three cycle two, four, five. Four cycles are odd, so it's minus the four cycle two, four, six, five. And finally, it's plus the product of two transpositions, 2, 5, and 4, 6. So the main property of Garnier elements is the following Garnier relation. For the tableaus T and the sets A and B as above, we have that when we apply the Garnier element GAB to the polytabloid ET, we get zero. Proof. For an element tau from the column stabilizer of T, the tabloid of tau T has at least two elements from the set A union with B in the same row. This holds by the pigeon hole principle, because if we permute the elements A and B in these positions, we still will have two elements in the i's row. Therefore, we can use the sign lemma and conclude that if we take the anti-symmetrizer for this symmetric group on the union of A and B and apply it to the tabloid of tau t, we get zero. Since the polytabloid ET is a linear combination of such tabloids, it follows that the anti-symmetrizer for S A union with B kills ET. At the same time, the product of S A and S B belongs to the column stabilizer of T. By the sign lemma, for any element sigma in the column stabilizer of T, 
applying sigma minus to ET gives us ET. Therefore, if we apply the anti-symmetrizer for SA times SB to ET, we will get ET back up to some non-zero constant. Also note that by construction, the anti-symmetrizer for the symmetric group of A union with B is equal to the product of the Garnier element for A, B and the anti-symmetrizer of SA times SB. So this is because the Garnier element is just the sum we pick in each coset one representative and take into account its sign, and this is the sum over all cosets. And SA times SB then gives the contribution for the rest of the coset if we take the corresponding anti-symmetrizer. Now, if we look at the formulas 1 and 2, we see that we can take the formula of 1, divide in this formula the common contribution of the anti-symmetrizer of SA times SB, and we will get exactly the formulation of the proposition. So this proves our Garnier relation. So let us see how this works for our explicit example of the tableau T of shapes 3, 2, 1, where we had 1, 2, 3 in the first row, 5, 4 in the second row, and 6 in the third row. So we have our row descent 5, 4 in the second row. So we have saw the Garnier element, so it's, it was a linear combination of various things. We apply it to the polytabloid ET, and we leave the ET, so there will be one ET which corresponds to the identity element there. We leave it on the left-hand side, and we move to the right-hand side the linear combination of the remaining polytabloids which we obtain. In this way, we can write ET as a linear combination of the following six polytabloids, which corresponds to the compositions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 5, 1, 4, 3, 2, 5, 6, 1, 4, 3, 2, 6, 5, and finally y5, 3, 2, 6, 4. And here we can observe that we have now resolved our descent in the second row. So in all these polytabloids which we got, in exactly the descent in the second row is now resolved. It's gone. It, it is not there anymore. But there is a price to pay. In some of the tabloids which we obtain, we introduced new descents in the first row. There was no descent in the first row in T, but here in the last three tabloids, we have 4-3, 4-3, and 5-3. We introduced new descents in the first row. And the idea of the proof, we should now do this, and we should take care of this new introduced descents using some kind of induction. So let us now describe this induction process, which completes the proof of our statement that polytabloids for standard Young tableaus generate the Specht module as a vector space. So to define the induction process, we define column tabloids as column equivalence classes of tableaus. And then we can define the column tabloid dominance order similarly how we define the usual tabloid dominance order. Note that each column tabloid equivalence class has a unique element in which all columns increase top to bottom. And these are exactly the tableaus which we are interested in. And so we know that it's enough only to consider such elements. Note that the unique maximum column tableau is obviously standard. So we have the column tableau where we write 1 to n, column-wise, top to bottom, left to right. So for that column tableau, it is standard, the claim that the corresponding polytabloid is in the necessary linear span is obvious. So what we do, we then proceed by induction with respect to the column dominance order. Note that the application of the Garnier relation to a row descent, when we want to resolve a row descent, we can potentially create new row descents, but these row descents which we create will be strictly bigger in the column dominance order as we necessarily move some larger elements to the right. 
and hence these new row descents can be taken care of by induction. And this completes the proof of the main theorem for this lecture. So here is an illustration of the claim on our running example. So we have just shown that if we take the polytabloid for 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, and 6, we can use the Garnier relation to write it as a linear combination of five other polytabloids, and in three of them we introduce new row descents. So again, we can use Garnier relation to eliminate this new row descents. So in particular, we can write the polytabloid for 1, 4, 3, 2, 5, 6 as the polytabloid for 1, 3, 4, 2, 5, 6 minus the polytabloid for 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, and similarly for the two other polytabloids. And then when we plug in these expressions into the first formula, we get an expression how we can write the polytabloid for the non-standard Young tableau 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 6 as a linear combination of polytabloids for eight standard Young tableaus. So this is an illustration how the main result works in reality. Okay, let us finish with some problems and questions. Question one, write down all standard Young tableaus with four boxes. Question two, check the assertion of the main theorem for the Specht module S upper 2,2 by a direct calculation. Question three, compute explicitly the matrix M from the proof of linear independence in the case when the partition lambda is the partition 3,2. Question four, compute the Garnier element for the descent 6,5 in this tableau. So the tableau has shape 2,2,2 two, two, with 1,2 two in the first row, 3,4 in the second row, and 6,5 in the third row. And question five, Prove with all details the formula that the anti-symmetrizer for S A union with B is equal to the Garnier element for A comma B times the anti-symmetrizer for S A times S B. This is a formula which we used in the proposition where we proved the Garnier relation. Thank you very much and see you next time.